let's start. Today we are going to talk about self-supervised learning. So let me uh, briefly recap uh, the supervised and unsupervised learning frameworks that we have covered in different lectures of this course. In the supervised learning, we are given a label data set. We are given X eyes and Y eyes. Let's say we have M samples. These are label data sets that we have. And as we uh, have discussed, uh, labeling is expensive in uh, different applications, sometimes impossible. Uh, because of that, we uh, also looked into unsupervised learning problems, where we don't have Y's, we don't have labels, we only have X's. Okay, in supervised learning, the task was clear. So we are given some training samples, X, X's and Y's. So we wanna learn a function. And in the test time, we are given an X and we wanna use that function in order to predict the label. In unsupervised learning, we have a little bit more flexibility in defining the task that we are uh, trying to solve. For example, we looked into uh, generative modeling where the task is to generate realistic about synthetic samples from you know, the same underlying distributions that generated my training samples. And we looked into different um, um, methods to deal with this problem like GANs, variational autoencoders, flow-based models, etc. All right, so today's goal is a little bit different than either supervised and unsupervised learn. So in today's goal, we want to find powerful representations of different types of data. These are also called embeddings of data. So we want to find these uh, powerful representations. So if you are given X as your data, again, unlabeled, we don't have labels. It, it is similar to the unsupervised learning setup. So we want to find a representation, a good representation tation of X. Okay, so what do we mean by a good representation? Right? So how can I evaluate if a representation is good or not? So we would argue in the stuff we cover during this lecture that a good representation is a representation that will allow me to solve some downstream tasks quite efficiently. For example, if you are interested in image classification problem, I want to use, instead of using X's in my classifier, I want to be able to use my representation of X's, F of X's in the classification problem and solve it more efficiently than the case that I use X's in as my input, right? For example, you may say if this representation is good, then even though I don't have labels, uh, when I'm training my embedding, my representation, I expect to see samples coming from different labels to somehow cluster together. Therefore, they're, they're, they, they will be linearly separable. Uh, if that's the case, then I can just train a linear classifier on top of my embeddings, on top of my representations in order to perform the classification task quite efficiently. Right, so let me just write this up. One example is that we can use f of x's, these uh, representations of my inputs to 
solve the classification problem more efficiently. For example, we are going to just use linear classifiers on f of x and see how we perform. So you would say, okay, so why I'm using a linear classifier on f of x? So what, what should I compare against? So yeah, so you can use linear classifier on x. It is not going to work well, especially on image uh, data set because we know there are a lot of uh, nonlinear dependencies among uh, features in my data. So linear classifier on X is not going to work out. But if I have a good representation, then a linear classifier potentially can work well on uh, the representations of Xs that I have. But the interesting uh, point here is that in learning these representations, I don't know my downstream task yet. So I don't have the labels uh, in order to learn these embeddings. Of course, the two uh, objectives that we are going to discuss, the downstream task, which is the classification task, and the task of learning these representations, they should be somehow related to each other. So you cannot you know, learn a representation on images and then let's say my downstream task is to use these representations to, um, I don't know, like predict the election results. So the tasks should be somehow related to each other. Uh, but a priori, we don't know the labels in order to learn these representations. So that's basically the, um, uh, the kind of framework that we are going to be discussing today. So as I mentioned, the question here is that what are the relationships uh, between the representation learning and the downstream task in order to make sure uh, this whole framework is successful? In other words, what representations f of x would be suitable for a particular downstream downstream task. Okay, uh, so if you view this framework um, in uh, you basically you can view this framework in two steps right so this is called the self-supervised learning framework so in step one in basically I'm solving task one in task one, I want to find a good representation of my data from unlabeled data. Learn a good representation of data from, so this is very important, unlabeled samples. And usually unlabeled samples are much easier to uh, collect than label samples. So we have a lot of data uh, to deal with task one. So in task two, this is my downstream task. This is how I'm going to evaluate my embeddings, my representations. I'm going to use uh, f of x, the representations of my samples, in a linear classification problem to see how I am doing. Use f of x, says, plus labels. So here I have labels, uh, maybe few, you know, not a lot of labels, but I would just write few labels to solve classification problem 
using linear models. There are a couple of things I, I, I you know, I'm interested in task two. One is how many labeled samples I need using f of x's in order to solve this classification problem and how well I'm going to do with a linear classifier on top of my f of x's compared to what? The gold standard here is to you know, just use labeled samples from scratch. If I had those labeled samples, just train a neural network end to end and see what performances I can achieve in the classification, right? So even if I knew the task two ahead of time and I had the labels in the first part, so I can just train an end-to-end -end neural network in order to solve the classification problem. And I'm going to compare with the performance I'm going to obtain, um, obtain using end-to-end -end, uh, supervised learning with labels. So here, the, the key difference here is that the first part, we don't have labels. And in the second part, we actually may need very, very few samples, maybe uh, five labeled samples per class. Right? So that, that, that's a possibility if we get a good representation f of x from x's. I see there's a question. Sai, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. So my question is basically, you said few labels. I'm assuming it's a few short scenario where there are few labeled examples. But my main overarching question is, now that the field is moving towards end-to-end -to -end models where people are showing that training models end-to-end -end, uh, is better than training a feature extractor and a classifier, do you think task two is really important for uh, evaluating self-supervised methods or is uh, getting an initialization method for downstream tasks, like a better initialization method is more important? It's a, it's a better way to initiate, so a better way to evaluate these methods. A good question. Um, so I think what you are also alluding is, uh, you know, to see if we can get some good initializations for a certain task and maybe do like fine tuning based on that. So that's also related to meta learning. Uh, hopefully we'll cover that next lecture if we finish stuff we cover uh, today. Uh, but here, uh, the idea is to obtain powerful data representations. And I would argue that, in fact, this is a very, very important problem because, you know, sometimes um, you may uh, have an end-to-end -end training for a particular task, uh, but then at the end of the day, your other task may be slightly different than what your end-to-end -end training uh, were. So then you have to, again, collect label data for the new task and you know, run an expensive training process in order to train the model from scratch for a new task. Here, what we are arguing is that if you come up with these good representations, good embeddings for samples, then it will make solving the downstream task much easier, much more efficient. And that's one way to do it. Of course, there are other ways to you know, deal with this problem. In fact, uh, this problem uh, using unlabeled plus some few labeled uh, samples, it is a very classical problem of semi-supervised learning, right? So in semi-supervised learning, so it uses unlabeled samples plus some few labeled samples in order to solve a specific task. So the difference, the key difference between semi-supervised learning and self-supervised learning that you know I haven't described yet, I'm just you know giving the big picture, is that in semi-supervised learning we ahead of time we knew what tasks we are going to deal with. But in self-supervised learning, in learning these embeddings, we actually don't know what the uh, downstream um, task uh, will be in order to, uh, in order to learn uh, appropriate embeddings and representations of the data. 
Okay, uh, sorry, do you have follow up questions or your hand is being raised from the previous no, question? No, sorry, it was, yeah, it's from the okay. All right, so that's like kind of like the big picture, but let me be a little bit more specific what we mean by uh, self supervised learning. Supervised learning. In self supervised learning, we want to use structure in unlabeled data to create artificial supervised learning problems in order to learn them. Remember, so I don't have in, in the first part, I don't have the labels, right? So if I had the labels, you know, my life would have been amazing, right? So I just uh, train a supervised uh, model, uh, uh, use a supervised loss, and then I'll be done. I don't have the labels, but perhaps I can create some artificial labels in order to solve a supervised learning problem, artificial supervised learning problem. And in the process, maybe I can look at some internal representations in my network in order to use them as appropriate embeddings and representations of the data. But that's basically the key idea of self-supervised learning. So let me write this up. So here we use structure in unlabeled data to create, so this is very important, artificial supervised learning problems solved via deep models, right? Solved via deep learning. And the, 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 the goal is that in, in, the, in this process, within this process, the learning method Hopefully, so let me put this in quote unquote, hopefully will create internal representations for the data. Data that we'll call f of x or representation. And hopefully these representations will be useful in downstream tasks that we have. So a lot of hopefully, you know, nothing, you know, uh, rigorous at this point, a lot of hand wavy stuff. So, but that's the idea. So I'm gonna, I'm given an unlabeled data. I'm going to create artificial label data from it, try to solve those artificial labeled supervised models. And then the model I'm learning in order to solve those problems, I'm going to look into those models and learn some representations from, uh, for the data as my f of x. And hopefully those representations will be good for some unknown downstream tasks like, um, uh, like classification problem. But that's basically the, the big picture. Okay. Uh, so let's start with a very interesting and quite surprising uh, observation for image embedding. I would just write surprising observation for image embedding. Uh, this observation is being made in uh, two simultaneous papers. 
CLR 2018 and Zang ETL in 2019. All right. So the idea is the following. So I'm, I want to learn image embeddings. Uh, I want to create artificial uh, labels for my images. So let's say I have an image X. For simplicity, let's say we are, we, we are looking at MNIST, but it can be done for uh, many uh, other data sets. So the, the, the data I have here, I don't have the labels. I don't have ones or twos or threes. I don't have the labels for it. So I'm going to rotate these images and have the rotation angle as my label. So here, the original image, the rotation angle is zero. And I'm going to create, I'm just going to rotate all of my images. So these samples will have a label of um, uh, 90 degrees. I'm going to look at these samples, they'll have a 180 degree rotation. And you are seeing here, we are even looking at discrete, uh, discrete angles, discrete uh, rotations here. So um, with some resolution, it doesn't matter. So you can look at higher resolutions as well. Okay, so I created labels. I created artificial labels for my samples. Then I'm going to train a convolutional network, a ConvNet, to predict the rotation angle from images, from Xs. So I have X, I'll, I'll have a convolution network. So this is a convnet. And then uh, these are going to, let's say this is my soft plus layer, soft max layer. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have the labels. What are the labels here? Labels here are the rotation angles. Okay, so this is the problem I can solve. Very, very efficiently, I have complex, just create some artificial, uh, artificial labels, solve this problem using supervised learning, right? cross entropy loss, whatever loss that you want to solve. Then I'm going to chop off the head of this neural network. I'm going to just look into the first part, ignore the, the soft uh, max layer and call that as my embedding, right? From X to the last layer before the, um, the soft max layer. So this is called a penultimate layer. That's going to be my embedding. And this F is already being trained using a supervised loss, a cross entropy loss to predict my angles. Do you think that F of X would be a good representation of images or not? Uh, one answer, no. Why not? Um, it says just rotation. Uh, good point. So it's just rotation, right? So my network doesn't need to learn anything meaningful 
about images, anything about like, you know, the texture, the, the, the shapes. So if it quantifies, if it characterizes rotation, then that's it, right? So you, if you have like, like 90 degree rotation, 180 degree, 270 degree, and in fact, you can just like, you know, in your brain, you can think about it, right? So you have an image, you have a 90 degree version of it. You can just like apply, you know, rotation 90 degree to see if it matches exactly or not. If it, it, you apply, you know, you know, two or three other types of rotations and then uh, define the loss function based on that, right? So there is no, there is no need in order to, for the network, in order to, you know, learn some kind of semantic level information uh, from, from images uh, using this. No need. Uh, therefore, if I take, use, if I use these representations, I compute f of x's, in a linear classification model to predict the labels, that's the task two, to evaluate the quality of the embeddings, it shouldn't be good, right? So it should basically just have the rotation information of the images that has nothing to do with their labels, the actual labels based on like either, you know, ones or twos on MNES or cats or dogs on ImageNet. So using f of x's in, um, in a linear classification model surprisingly works amazingly well. Look at these representations, use a, the linear classifier on top of it, they, they, the performance is very impressive. So I don't report the exact numbers, but you, you can look at the papers to look at the numbers. Very, very impressive. In fact, you can try it at home. You know, it's a very simple task. The downstream task is the classification uh, task uh, on two labels, on MNES, MONS, twos, threes, on ImageNet, like cat stocks, whatever labels you have. So a model, let me just clarify that in a linear classification model for the two labels. Good question. Okay, so what is going on here? Why, why should f of x, the embeddings, be a good representation for images successful for the downstream classification task uh, with respect to their true labels. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Uh, Samik, go ahead. Hi, Professor. What I feel here is that uh, the convert can directly learn the ones in four directions and twos in four directions like the like the con maps feature maps can directly learn the numbers separately and that way this task works but does it work in like more difficult images it, it does work actually on ImageNet scale so, you know, the reason I didn't draw it image because, you know, I don't want to draw a cat and <laughs> more difficult. Um, it actually does work on, you know, more complex data sets like ImageNet and CIFAR. Um, why do you think it should work? Because my network can just look at the rotations. If it characterizes rotations, then it doesn't have to look into the, uh, into the texture, into the semantic level information. From, uh, from images in order to provide any meaningful embeddings. Is it because of our uh, optimization? Maybe, maybe. So I see there is a question also, uh, Anir says, could this be due to the implicit bias of confnet filters? 
would a fully connected network perform uh, just as good? Um, uh, there is another question or you know comment because it has to focus on global structure. Uh, the you know the the answer is I don't know, right? So the, it's an open uh, question uh, to to understand why in fact this works. There are some conjectures, as you know, some of you mentioned. One conjecture is that, okay, Covnet is a very particular way of predicting um, rotation labels from X's. So it doesn't, it is not able to characterize a rotation matrix. Uh, and therefore, it tries to solve the problem in a different way. It, by maybe first learning some semantic information from images and then trying to see you know, what kind of, you know, rotations um, uh, the, the, the images uh, suffer, uh, images have, you know, from or uh, artificial labels. Yeah, but in general, uh, this is still an open question. So it's a very intriguing question um, to think about. Katami, go ahead. Uh, so hell, I'm just thinking, uh, since conval convolution nets are not uh, rotation equivariant, maybe this is acting like uh, some kind of regularization and actually, uh, what do you say, like, uh, I mean, that could be the reason why uh, this is working better than like normal model. Yeah, I, I bet, you know, ComNet plays an important role. If you, uh, if you had a function that can characterizes rotation, rotation matrices. Uh, I thought it will uh, learn some meaningful uh, embeddings for images. Uh, that's kind of, you know, high level information as you know, some of you mentioned in terms of like the inductive biases of confident, uh, but remains to be seen, right? So there is, you know, to be honest, I haven't thought hard about this problem myself, um, but, uh, I think it's an interesting problem to, to think about. Okay, um, any other questions? So that was just one example just to explain what I mean by creating some artificial supervised learning models, learning representations, and then using these representations in a downstream plan. So that's called self-supervised learning in general. But learning embeddings is not a new problem, right? It's actually a very, very old problem, learning data representations. Uh, in fact, uh, in natural language processing, learning embeddings uh, is very important. There are very famous classical embeddings, uh, embedding methods like word 2 vec that replaces each word with a real vector. Very important, especially in domains with discrete objects like and language, uh, in order to represent these words, we replace them with some vectors, and then we can, you know, analyze it more efficiently. So I'm going to uh, quickly explain sentence embedding, uh, which is related to what we are going to uh, discuss. So it can also be used as a word embedding, word sentence. Embedding, especially I'm going to talk about um, this paper, recent paper, which is, I believe, state of the art in sentence embedding. And Lee in ICLR 2018. So they propose the following way to learn uh, embeddings for sentences. They use text uh, corpus, for example, Wikipedia to train deep representations using the following optimization. So I'm going to look at adjacent sentences. Let's say X is one sentence that I want to find it is embedding. I'm going to look at it is adjacent uh, sentence, X plus, these are 
adjacent sentences. And let's say x minus, it's a random sentence. I look at, you know, my text, look at all oh, like x, what are the adjacent sen sentences to this? And maybe pick a random sentence, uh, sentence from the corpus. Now I'm going to solve the following optimization problem. So I'm going to find an embedding, a representation F that minimizes the following objective. So I'm looking to log of one plus e to the power f of x transpose times, let me just write transpose with capital T, x minus minus f of x transpose times f of x plus. They're the adjacent sentences, right? So I have this objective function. Uh, F is going to be a neural network mapping X's to, um, uh, to embeddings. And uh, I'm going to minimize this objective function. So let's see what, what is going on here in this objective function. Okay, so let's assume, uh, just to build some intuition, let's assume the inner products are large. So I can kind of ignore this one for now, just for as an intuition. So I have a log of x exponent. So applying that, I'll get just the, uh, the exponent. If x transpose times f x minus, minus f x transpose f x plus. And I, I'm trying to minimize this. What it means, there's a negative sign here, if you're uh, looking at this uh, second term. So basically I'm maximizing the inner product between embeddings of adjacent sentences. Maximize inner product between adjacent sentences, x and x pluses. And here we are doing the opposite way. Way. We are minimizing inner product between embeddings of adjacent, adjacent uh, 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 my sentence as a random sentence, right? So that's basically the uh, intuition behind, behind this uh, objective. So in other words, if I have X as my sentence, I like X, the embedding of an adjacent sentence to be close to X. Right. So that's why I try to match the angles of these uh, embeddings. I want to maximize their inner products. On the other hand, if I have a random sentence, probably the, a random sentence, uh, if I am randomly selecting it from a you know, large corpus, it's not going to be relating, related to the sentence in, in hand. So I want that sentence to be in the opposite direction in terms of its embedding. So this objective, this way of learning embeddings is called contrastive learning. And this loss function or some other related loss function with the same intuition, they are called contrastive loss functions. Okay, here again, remember, I do not have any labels. I do not you know if these sentences are, you know, they have positive annotations uh, or not, right? So no labels, no labels of topics for these different sentences to see if they're related to each other or not. So here I'm just using the fact that sentences near to each other should be mapped, should be embedded to uh, vectors that are closer to each other compared to random sentences. And that's the contrastive part. So we are maximizing uh, similar uh, embeddings while minimizing um, inner products between random embeddings. Okay. Um, 
Let me pause and see if there are questions. Um, isn't it better to normalize the embeddings or do we want to focus on the magnitude? Too? Good question. Uh, there are many ways to define contrastive loss functions. In fact, you know, the, the one I'm going to describe to uh, that's basically state of the art for image embeddings. They use a normalized version of these F, Fs in order to define their similarities. Um, uh, but nevertheless, these are uh, small implementation details in order to how to define similarities and uh, you know between similar samples and vice versa. Okay, is language model trained to predict the next word, a self-supervised or unsupervised learning model? So here, I'm just, you know, I'm not even looking at the, uh, the follow-up task, right? So here I'm looking at finding embeddings that are good for a variety of tasks. And then later on, you, um, you know, you will see that maybe you can use these embeddings in order to perhaps fill out, a, you know, some missing words or missing sentences in your, uh, in your um, uh, you know, paragraph or in your sentence. And, you know, that would come from your contrastive learning or embeddings that you're learning from your words and sentences. Okay. Uh, so this approach actually has an impressive performance. Uh, it basically captures human notions of similarities uh, of, uh, between sentences. Let me give some examples from the paper. Basically sentence embeddings capture human notion of similarities. Let's say if I have a sentence saying the tiger rules this jungle, it happens to be similar using the embeddings that they have learned to a lion hunt in a forest. And as you can see, they don't share actually any words, right? So it's not like a word by word um, um, similarity of these sentences. So it kind of shows these embeddings learned by contrastive learning can actually be extremely powerful in learning good representations of complex data sets. So the key question then is that, is that can we use similar loss function like contrastive learning for images? That's like one of the main uh, applications uh, that we are going to look into in terms of you know, image classifications and some other downstream tasks. Can we use contrastive learning to obtain powerful data representation for images? Okay. So what do um, what do we need? in order to use contrastive learning in order to accomplish this task. So we need pairs of similar uh, images and maybe pairs of dissimilar images. That would be pairs of similar images, let's call them X and X pluses, and potentially pairs of this similar images, I'll call them X and X minuses. And I wanna learn an embedding of images going from X to F of X. Okay. 
what would be a, or evaluation metric? I'm going to, as I mentioned before, I'm going to use a linear classifier on top of f of x to see how I'm doing in a downstream classification task to see if these representations I am learning without having any labels, are they linearly separable in terms of intrinsic labeling of my data? So that's basically the, um, the um, question that we wanna answer. So first I'm going to talk about some practical methods in order to deal with this problem. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about some theory behind, behind uh, these methods with a very important caveat. I'm going to emphasize that none of these theories are complete. So this is a very ongoing and active area of research. So there are some efforts to explain at least partially what is going on, uh, but they are not complete. And that's why first I'm going to talk about some practical methods, practical ways of dealing with this problem, and then looking to some of the theoretical results. And in fact, that would make it easier to compare the assumptions that the theory makes in order to deal with this problem with the uh, way uh, we do it in practice. Okay, so I see there are a few questions. Let me pause here and see uh, what those questions are. How did we get the image pairs? Very good question. Uh, so, so far it is abstract, right? What are these image pairs that we have here, similar and dissimilar? So that will be clarified when I explain how these methods work. For the downstream tasks, do we train a separate softmax layer or do we just cluster and label uh, each other? So we are going to use just a logistic regression for the downstream task. A linear classifier, of course, you know, followed by a softmax in order to turn uh, the numbers into probabilities. Amir, go ahead. My, my question is general about this set of this learning setting. Um, so assume that like if, if A is um, similar to, a, to another point, say B, and B is similar to C, but A is dissimilar to C, which is very, very realistic. Uh, say it again. So A is similar to? To B, and B is similar to C, but A is not similar to C. So we very can't good, make a transitive um, assumption here. Do, do, does, does this learning setting um, sort of provide? So I think the under, underlying assumption is that it should be transitive, right? Yes, yes. You know, that's a, actually, that's an excellent, that's an excellent point. Uh, so we, uh, this way of learning, if you just look at pairwise similarities and dissimilarities, we won't be able to capture structures like this, like A is similar to B, B is similar to C, but A and C, they are dissimilar. So we need to have like some sort of, you know, transitivity of similarities. On, Images, um, you know, sentences, words, usually we do have that, right? So let's say if you are considering similar images, images with the same label, right? So all of them, all cats are similar, of course not, but like let's say all cats are similar. So cat one and cat, cat A and cat B, they're similar, cat B and cat C are similar. So cat A and C, they are similar to each other, right? Uh, but if you have some more uh, complex, similarity and dissimilarity relationships, that may actually not be the case. And in, in, in that case, you, uh, you know, the pairwise contrastive losses won't work. You can think a little bit about, you know, um, I'm not sure in the literature people have considered, but you can think about higher order contrastive losses as well that looks into not only pairwise similarities, but like similarities um, within a group and those, are some possibilities in those cases, but we are not going to consider those cases within this lecture. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, so there is another question. That would be, um, 
uh, yeah, but like, you know, the, 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 the comment here is that in these cases, we'll capture it because we sample it, you know, X and X minuses. But remember, X minus is randomly sampled from like potentially a very large space. So the chance that we'll be able to sample these very fine structures, similarity and dissimilarity structures would be very, very low. So that's why I believe in those cases, confessive learning won't be very successful. Okay, so let me uh, move on. Um, I was extremely, extremely optimistic about how much I can cover today. So um, probably we'll, we are going to um, uh, need to continue this topic in the next lecture as well. And probably you have noticed along the way I update the, uh, the, the, the syllabus because you know sometimes some lectures take a little bit longer uh, than expected so I need to move around some of the, some of the topics. Okay, so let's talk first about some practical ways to deal with this problem. So I'm going to talk about this method called SimClear, introduced very recently, I believe in the summer 2020. There are some other related methods, but I'm going to mainly focus on this practical implementation of uh, contrastive learning. So we are going to, there, there are multiple steps in order to learn the embeddings. First, we are going to create two correlated views of an image. Create two correlated views of an image X. Let's call them X um, I and xj. So these are two correlated views uh, from this image. How are we going to uh, create these correlated views? We're going to use data augmentations. So in particular, in the paper, they use three types of data augmentations. One is based on random cropping and resize. The other one is based on random color distortion. And the third one is based on random Gaussian blur. Just add a Gaussian noise to, to the image. So pick one of these families maybe it's a Gaussian blur, and create two correlated views, maybe two Gaussian uh, noisy version of the image with you know, different uh, noise realizations. So let's uh, call them, so this is X, basically sample from your um, augmentation represented by T, create XI tilde, and make another sample from the augmentation that you have, call it XJ tilde. So these are multiple views of the same uh, image, but potentially with some noise um, uh, involved in each of them. So in the second step, we are going to uh, use a base encoder in order to map these Xs into some embedding space use encoder base encoder f and i think the paper uses resnet in order to do it it's a standard architecture that you use basically map access to uh, your uh, embeddings so these H's, they are going to serve as or embeddings. Okay, so one um, novelty this paper has, and they show it actually helps 
in terms of the uh, performance uh, of uh, their self-supervised approach is to add additional nonlinear projection head on top of these embeddings before looking at the similarities between embeddings. Remember, uh, in the sentence embedding that we discussed, uh, so these F X's, they're your H, H's, right? So these are embedding. And after applying F, then you look at the similarities or dissimilarities between um, similar pairs or dissimilar pairs. And if we wanted to do that, we would have looked into the contrastive loss between HI and HJs. These are my embeddings. But what they are arguing is that apply another um, function g on top of these h's first and obtain z i and z j and then look at the agreement maximize agreement between these two pairs So the third step is basically a projection head G. It is implemented using a one hidden layer NLP. But the important, important point here is that I want to note here ZIs are not embeddings. They're going to use HIs are the embeddings. In other words, at the end of the day, this G function is going to be thrown away uh, in mapping access to their uh, embeddings. So I'll you know, the, in the paper, they explain in a hand wavy fashion why uh, this is helpful. So I'll talk about that in a bit. But let me, um, uh, let me uh, introduce a loss function first and then explain, you know, how, uh, you know, what is going on here. Okay, so they define in the, the force step, which is the loss function. What is the loss function? They define a similarity metric between ZIs and ZJs, and that's just the cosine similarity. Similarity between ZI and ZJ is ZI transpose ZJ divided by their norms. And this is related to one of the questions asking, you know, why don't we normalize it? Yes, they normalize it here. It's also kind of called cosine similarity. Okay, so in the learning process, we are going to randomly select n samples from our data, x1 to xn, and add their augmentations. Right, so basically I have two N samples. I have X1 and an augmented version of X1, X2 an augmented version of X2, Xn an augmented version of Xn. How many samples I have? I have two N samples. And here it addresses one question I think Gautami asked, how we compute similar images. That's basically it, right? X and X pluses, they are going to be considered similar, similar pairs. And this similar pairs, so I'm just going to randomly select one from these two N samples. Okay, so next I'm going to compute a similarity matrix between all of these samples that I have. Compute the similarity matrix. Uh, 
So the similarity matrix is 2n by 2n, looking at similarities between each pairs of samples in this artificial data set that we are crafting. Right? So the 2n data sets that we are crafting. Okay, so that's my S. And I'm going to order it by put first putting x1, then first putting x1 plus, then x2, x2 plus, xn, xn plus. Okay, it's a 2n by 2n. So each value here is sij, which is uh, the, you look at the similarities and look at just the exponential version of it. It's just the transformation, similarity between zi and zj. Okay, so let's understand this matrix a little bit uh, better. So what are the diagonal elements? I have some diagonal elements, right? So similarity between Z i and Z i. So this is going to be one. Right, but I'm looking at the exponent exponent of that, right? So it's going to be E. Right, so the diagonal elements are going to be E. Okay, so what about uh, like an immediate off-diagonal element? If I look at, um, let me use a different color. If I look at similarity between X1 and X1 plus, right, these, these terms. Or X2 and X2 plus. What would be um, the similarity between them? Hopefully it would be a high number, right? So because these are like somehow augmented version of each other, high number, smaller than E because that's the best you can get, but hopefully it will be close to E. So basically every four numbers that I have in the diagonal should be, should be high. So I have um, again, another four numbers here. So all of them should be roughly speaking high. So what about off diagonal elements? Let's say I, I pick, a, pick an element here. So do I expect the similarity to be high or low? Low, right? So these are random samples. So I want the similarity to be low. So if I, if you like, just you know, step back and look at this matrix, you should see that basically the diagonal elements are quite um, high, or immediate off-diagonal elements are quite high, and the rest they are going to be low. And in that case, I'll have a good embedding. I'll have a good similarity matrix. So in order to capture it. What they do is to define a loss function. So for each row, so look at each row, row i. So they define um, the following loss function. Minus log of similarity that you get between i and j, divide by um, the sum of similarities you see in that row, except that the diagonal element, that it is basically k is equal to i. So I'm going to look at k not equal to i, look at um, the sum of the all elements I receive, and i and j, they're consecutive. So these are like positive pairs. Uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be clear in, in the next line. So my overall loss function is going to be just average of the losses ij between my positive pairs. Note that it is not symmetric, right? Because I'm just normalizing based on some of the rows. So if you are looking at x1 and x1 plus, the sum of the rows can be different. So what they are doing, they're taking the average between samples 2k minus one and 2k and 2k and 2k minus one, so it is not symmetric. Divide by two, taking the average, and then sum it up over all n samples that you have and divide by n. And that's basically the loss function 
that they consider in their optimization. So this loss function is going to be minimized over your F and G. Very simple, it's a, uh, it's a deep model. And at the end of the day, we train it and then we throw away G and use F as our embeddings. That's basically the uh, gist of the um, idea of uh, this paper. Uh, okay, so let me uh, pause uh, and uh, take questions there. Um, I still need to talk about, you know, different components of the methods that they have proposed and some practical observations. And then we'll switch gear and talk about the theory of it, you know, what is going on here. So why uh, this learning should provide embeddings uh, that are meaningful for a downstream classification task.